Comedy, comedy is what I do, and so like to get it, you know, like you have to go and be like producer, or I don't even know if you went back to, went to slam dance with the character that you played, and if there's a hell below, like, you know, you were talking about that character, only to have to come back, I guess it's acting, and be Link. You're, you're being incredibly kind. I don't have a compliment fight with you up here. No, I'm no, no. but I, I, I think you're, you know. Yeah. Selling yourself short on a pretty tremendous performance yourself. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah, no, I don't, yeah. Well, I, it's really nice to have someone to put it off of. Okay, all right. All right, all right, all right. Yeah. All right, all right. One more point in the competition that continues. Well, here's the, here's the other thing about what's, well, you know, uh, the film is that Jagger is... It was, uh, actually, sorry to interrupt you. I, I saw you in a film called Little Rock. That's oh, actually yeah. how I, I discovered you. It was in Little Rock at a, at a theater in, uh, in Seattle. And what, wasn't it snowing that night? You almost didn't go to the theater, right? Yeah, all the roads were closed down, all the buses were shut down, but I, I trudged through the snow to see, to see Little Rock. The cancer was going to stop you. Yeah. Snow. <laughs> wow, snow and cancer? Yeah. Jesus Christ, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, so Little Rock was a film that I was in. So long ago too, like maybe twenty. I think that was twenty eleven. Yeah, twenty eleven. So that's actually one percent of producers. So the film, yeah. you've been thinking about the film for so long. Yeah. Yeah, for for years, and uh, and it's twenty nineteen, and it's it's in, in fruition. Is that and, and also this is your directorial debut, is what I was going to say. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thanks. How how has it? So the transition, so your usual art practice is writing, right? And then... Yeah. You're like, yeah, well, I, I was doing a lot of journalism during the whole uh, making of this or the production of this. Yeah. Writing about video games was for Vice, mainly. Right. So, yeah. I'm surprised there's actually not more video game references in there, except you're both like... That's pretty much it. You know, when we were watching it just now, because I, I think that was a line that was not in the script, and I was like, oh no, like, did I get my math wrong? Like, would that work out if I was 12 or something? You actually did get a slightly wrong. God! <laughs> 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 it's like, it was like, 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 like artistically, or like, how how did it fulfill you differently? I guess uh, what parts of you did you have to tap into? Obviously, it's a personal story for you, um, you know, opposed to I guess writing vice articles. But you know, that could be personal too. Yeah, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting. Like, I wasn't very um, uh, uh, like I felt pretty comfortable actually. Just coming to set and in directing, I think it's because it's almost like directing is, it, part of the things I've been working on screenplay for so long that uh, this was just sort of, it's almost like an extension of writing. It's like I know that this is supposed to be like this because I, I wrote it like that. And I know you're supposed to be like this because, you know, I, I wrote the character like that. So, you know, in a way it's, it's, uh, it's not that, the directing is that different. You know, it's a strange thing to say, like sitting at a desk and writing something, like being on a film set. But um, yeah, it just it, it, for for me, it was almost just an extension of writing. Yeah, it's, and then you, but you know, also directing, you had us do. I, there were like intense improv <laughs> games that I remember. Yeah. Yeah, you were, you were very game for them. Uh, you had your own, own thing. But most of the actors... Ooh, had, like, what was Connor's thing? Uh, just well, being a curmudgeon, I think. No, that's, that's, that's what I said. Oh, yeah, Connor's doing the real thing. You know, he's thinking in the corner, and he's, you know, he's got his own method, if you will. Yeah. You know, and then we were, we were, I think, we were making noises. You had us... Yeah, so basically I had the actors just kind of like... Like I would make a series of noises and sounds, and then they would imitate me. So I'd be like this, and, right. and then right. you would try to imitate that exactly right. as well as you could. And we would do this for a long time, yeah. every day, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That uh, was your directing style. That's that was, that was new. That was new for me, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. So you were you were you were really you were oh. game. You were you were you would go out. You know, if you like, you know, seven right. in the morning, I'd take you outside. You had to see. You know, and so the reason I was doing this is just because uh, it was basically trying to get the actors into um, like sort of party mode, as if they had been, uh, you know, drinking or a little high or, or whatever, um, and you know, kind of loosey goosey. So that's why we're doing that. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
according to him, but he was like, Lucy, Lucy, stay action. I just know I have a finite capacity for silliness, you know. <laughs> <laughs> all before the camera's rolling, then they call action. I'm like, yeah, welcome to the to my house. It's a party. <laughs> you were listening to head, headphones all the time. I remember. Oh, I never asked you what, they, what it was. Uh, I'm, I'm going to respect your privacy. I don't, I, I don't know if you're listening to music. I don't know if you're listening to, like, an uh, audio book. was. A pre-recorded reading of how you're going to do your... <laughs> I'm a very, yeah, it's just listening to myself actually. <laughs> <laughs> Which is every couple of years I'll hear some other actor talk about how she or he does it. I'll be like, oh yeah, that's the way I'm going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to listen to music now. I do remember you listening to music too. And you getting stoked about DJ as well. Oh. Yeah. This is a little walk on memory lane. I just don't know, like, is that, like, when you're, when you're going to, like, acting mode, you know, there's so many different processes. Is that, I guess that's maybe, is that something you still do? Uh, to listen to music? Listen to music, or even like, even if you're into DJing on the side, right? Sure. Like, I feel like that still feeds into your art practice. Like, what's your art practice consist of? So there's acting. Oh, yeah. for me. Yeah, for you, for you, Connor Wake Morris. up. For you, Connor Morris. Artistic push-ups. Breakfast. Yeah. Artistic sit-ups. Um, <laughs> acting is very important to me. Uh, I, you, you mentioned Producing, I think it's for, for John is a producer by trade, by profession, by heart. I, I'm a, a producer only in the sense that I want to make movies, and if there's anything I can do to empower other people right. to make those movies, I'm very eager to. Right, it feeds into your main thing, yeah. which is acting. Yeah, I, yeah. It's, it's, I don't want to sound too uh, reductive, but I, I am very excited about the reason that I like movies so much, making them, but also watching them, is because I can find. I find there to be a lot of comfort in the chaos of movies, uh, plays, sort of any any narrative medium that there's a sense of whatever you're struggling with, uh, maybe other people are struggling with it too. And even if the movie doesn't directly address thematically whatever it is that's going on with you, uh, there's a sense of community, there's a sense of, uh, it's a very plural idea of togetherness, and, and I find that very reassuring and very validating. Um, and so, if that's what movies give to me, I'm very excited to make movies in order to try and put out that to the world. Right. This is obviously a very particular film which intends intends to um, engage with one very specific subject, a subject that is real, and I think that films like that have a, a, a similar umbrella goal, but there are obviously more specific hopes and desires for a film. Yeah, it's such a remarkable process to go through the uh, screenplay um, development process. Jason and I worked for almost a couple of years on developing the motion picture screenplay. And when you're doing that in process, you're inside of um, all of these people and characters on paper. And so they're living in your imagination and in your heart and in your gut and you know, hopefully in your spirit. And you're allowing them to um, take actions based on you know, your intuitive notion of, of what they're going to do in specific situations that you're imagining and dreaming up. And then you know, Jay, particularly as a director, he knows down the line that all of those ideas on paper and all of that um, emotion and energy that is in word form is going to take human form through the casting process. And you, Hotsko, and you, Connor, are going to literally emerge and appear and um, take on the mantle of these things that we've lived with in discussions for years. And that process to me, as a producer, is uh, it's so um, inherently uh, um, alchemical and it's almost mystical because um, it all begins with you know discussion over coffee and then it ends here, or not ends, but it, it moves to here, yeah. We, we may even have other cast members in the audience. I saw we do have Hannah Horton. Michelle Henry, uh, Rochelle is here. Rochelle is here. Yeah. Is she here? Is she here? Is she here? Is she here? Is here too? Oh, oh my gosh. Sequoia? Yeah! Everyone's here. Wow, okay. Uh, I was trying to cast uh, uh, funny actors, you know, like likable people. So that's basically like the. the in the whole casting process, like, you know, these are these are some funny guys here. So I'm actually really glad that people were felt comfortable to laugh at the at the ravers being goofy because yeah. like that was like really one of the critical things I was trying to do. Like, you know, 
Uh, I mean, that's also part of like, the, the weird dance is like, getting out of like, the serious headspace. Because the ravers really needed to um, uh, be not thinking about the, uh, the tragic elements of the film. They really wanted to capture them as like, like living, funny people. Uh, um, so, uh, yeah, I'm just really happy with, 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 all, with all the cast. I mean, everybody did such a great job. We're, we're, we're so lucky to be such a you great know, we, cast. For, we had 16 speaking roles in this uh, uh, SAG ultra-low budget um, independent film, which is pretty remarkable to have that many speaking roles. And um, the casting process was bifurcated. We started, and then Jader came down with cancer, so we stopped, and then we picked it up again. And um, certain people uh, made the transition. Connor, you made the transition from that early phase into the next phase. And Osco, you also. I remember now the first time we met at the uh, um, Earth Cafe near the Bodie Bookstore on uh, Melrose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when we talked for the first time, which was uh, yeah many years ago. But here we are. Yeah, yeah. All of what I have one last question actually um, with with. What everyone said actually is an acting question. Is that okay? <laughs> uh, hopefully, it's okay. Um, yeah, it's so you were, you know, these two knew what kind of story they were telling and what effect they wanted to uh, have on the world. Uh, and you were saying, Connor, that you know, you like watching movies and uh, because of changes that it can make for the world, uh, and that's you know, hopefully what you're doing when you're playing a role. So uh, does it matter, like, the subject matter, or do you, like, when you look at a project, you know, uh, it does it have to touch you a certain way? Um, have you said no to things because you were like, well, that's not something that I want to touch necessarily? And when you do say no, is it for that reason, or is it for solely acting technical? Yeah. Sure. Um, I'll take a stab at it, and I'll maybe alley a bit up to Jager here. Um, I think the I, I think you know with a goal like this, it's very tricky to um, showcase uh, extreme violence in a film, particularly when this is real life violence. And so there's that question, and I, I think. The success of films like this, and I do think it's successful at doing this, the success of a film like this rises on the question of if there is this extreme violence and hatred to these terrible things in the world, is there a way to show that in a film independent of those elements? Is there a way to engage in a healthy, productive, are there benefits to showcasing that kind of violence? And I, I think there are, and I think it's a, an incredibly complex tightrope that you both walk admirably. Thank you. So, so, yeah, I mean, there, yeah, I mean, that was definitely a consideration how to, how to handle the violence, really because it, it is based on uh, uh, real events. Um, you know, part of it was just, I mean, it's not very simple, but just putting it at, at the beginning so that it's over with, you know, and, and then we're just dealing with the characters um, as living people, which is really how, how I want you to present them. So, um, you also, you know, on, on Kind of like technically how, how it was filmed, but you actually don't see anyone shot. Actually, it's off camera. It's always off, off camera. So um, uh, yeah, how how these things are are, are portrayed, is, you know, uh, it's definitely heavy on our minds with you know, the whole process. Yeah, we had uh, uh, infinite discussions on um, that level of sensitivity is not the right word, uh, but the way that you um, approach and have to treat that subject of violence in the context of um, what's on the page in the screenplay, and then ultimately what gets filmed and then what gets edited, and how um, we want the, uh, the film to uh, engage you, you all on an emotional level and on a level that uh, um, brings you closer to the story and the characters and use these tools of cinema that we have, sound and light, and action to um, bring you as close as possible to this event, um, but you're in the safety of, you know, obviously this movie theater. And that's the power of cinema, is you're now experiencing something that none of us should ever, ever experience, but you're, you're that close to it as a result of, of the tools and the genius of the filmmaking unit. I mean, it's a producer for me. The joy and the power is watching um, the whole um, collaboration 
come together and to uh, give their offering to what um, a film really is, and then to watch it all come together. Because, you know, I'm sure you know, but this is the, the outcome of um, a million decisions, um, you know, both personal and collective, that actually create this, um, this, this amazing film, which is Wallflower. And the unit makes the film, so uh, I, just, I just bow to everybody involved in the production, because it's really magnificent. If I, if I may briefly yeah. ask, to kind of tie it in a little more explicitly to your question, mm -hmm. I, I was excited about this film because I do think it, as John Digger was saying, presented an opportunity to try to have a conversation, try to have a dialogue about violence, about male rage, these things which even now have taken on a different face in sort of a, a post-2016, post-Trump world in which is kind of about to continue to escalate and I don't. My hope is that the film is um, personally resonant to audience members individually or as a whole, I did to each their own obviously, but it did seem like there was a great opportunity there to try and interrogate some of these things that live in our world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, with that said, let's open it up for, for more, but from other people. <laughs> If any of you have a question, there are hands, there are hands. Let's go with, uh, way in the back, actually, I think, yes, it's you, yes, yes, and I'll move down, yeah. Um, first of all, I just want to say this, I, I absolutely love the film, it was so wonderful to, to um, watch. Um, and to uh, Jager, I was just wondering if your work uh, covering your, uh, for Vice um, influenced this at all, or rather the other way around? <clears throat> Excuse me, just with like male rage and Gamergate and and um, other shooters like the San Clarita shooter who you know uh, cited um, hatred toward women and people of color and that sort of uh, thing, just as an example. Um, yeah, I, I definitely don't don't know if, it, if the film affected my journalism, um, but uh, yeah, you know I've kind of racked my brains to try and. Think of like how how that might have uh, influenced or not because I um, the way I, I write is pretty just um, uh, automatic you know I, I don't really um, just kind of let let, let it happen um, so yeah as I, as I said I'm surprised there weren't <laughs> there were more video game influences in there um, yeah so it's, it's definitely definitely not conscious in terms of the uh, uh, the video game influence in there. Not consciously. Yeah. Uh, yes, the hand right there. I know it's, uh, it's yes, uh, oh, mister. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, there seems to be a steadying drumbeat amongst the media in, a terms, in a self-critical way to minimize the amount that a in individual shooter is shown or portrayed in the news. And I'm wondering, you know, that's sort of given the length of your production, did you notice a change in that? How did you address this sort of evil protagonist that you were going to show from real life on the screen? Um, well, one of the decisions that uh, actually came later was uh, we decided not not to name the, I mean, the, the, we don't use any real names of the, of the ravers, you know, for privacy reasons and, and such. And so these are fictional creations. Uh, we were for a while in, in, in the script phase using the real name of, of the shooter, um, and uh, one of our one of our team is uh, actually a, a, a forensic psychiatrist, forensic psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Richard Adler, and uh, uh, he he strongly impressed upon us uh, to not actually use the real name of the shooter, um, so we. He became nameless, which I, I think actually, um, I think it works better also just filmically. Um, so yeah, that was that was something that we we've we've, uh, we've considered quite a bit. Um, I think dramatically you kind of have to follow him uh, because he's the one who knows what's what's going to happen, what could happen. Um, because otherwise, just something that would pop out as a surprise. Um, but yeah, there's something how to handle that was something on my mind. So. Yeah, it it, it, uh, it tracked throughout the entire process of development of the film. 
you know, when, you know, back to sort of the, the very beginning, having this feeling, okay, this is something that's important. I don't really know why, in terms of its totality, we're working on the film incident after incident after incident is happening. And um, we're continuing to work and, you know, not feeling necessarily, you know, energized or inspired by all this, but more like, you know, this is moving from something that was, um, you know, had a certain intent into an intent that feels um, more, uh, how can I put it, it's like, it's not mission oriented, but you just, you know, you can't help but, but keep going because you must, we must finish this film. We must get to this point. We must share it with the world because of the personal nature of it, given Jacob's connection to it, and then um, the struggle. Because to make this film, this is the most challenging film I've ever produced. To make this film, given the sensitivities associated with the survivor community, um, with the, um, the victim community, and with the world as we know it, as unfolding through the lens of these mass shootings, um, it is, has been to a degree like, like walking on eggshells, but it, it's, um, it's, it's worth it. But we, you know, we, have to, we have to go through this if we're going to get to a result and um, the result needs to be, um, you know, more love and less hatred. We have room for a couple more questions. I think we can do all three here. So <coughs> let's, uh, I'm going to go backwards and start here and go back. Hi. Hi. Um, the film was uh, amazing. Um, I just have a really quick question. Like, how long did it take to uh, shoot the film? Like, how many days? Your question was, sorry, really quick. Can everyone hear that? No. Okay. How many days did it take to shoot the film? How, yeah, how, so how many days did it take to shoot the film? I wish what, is what you just said. Was <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, I think it was 21 days. Was it 21 shooting days? or? Yeah, it was around, it was around uh, 20. Yeah, our last day was actually the, um, we were shooting the nighttime exteriors outside of the rave. And that night, on our last day, um, I mean, this is unforgettable in terms of movie making. Um, I'm standing over by the grip truck, and I'm looking at the grip truck, and I'm seeing like this orange light, and I'm like, why have the, the gaffers set up orange lights out here? And then just as I was thinking that, I hear fire! And all of a sudden, like literally, the generator is on fire that is powering the entire production, and it's like 3.30 in the morning. And, and the tree adjacent to it. Sorry. And the tree adjacent to it is on fire. And this is a bad situation in a film for safety, and it's our last night, and et cetera, et cetera. So all of a sudden, you know, two grips appear, they run over, and what had happened was a, uh, a PA had wrapped the generator with a blanket to muffle the sound, only they hadn't uh, anticipated that they actually had exhaust ports on generators, so we caught fire. And the, the scary part of it was there was a, a fuel can a few uh, feet away from that. So um, literally, the, they pulled the burning blankets off the generator, threw them into a pile. We, we got them out, and there was this big column of smoke coming up at the Seattle Center into the sky. And literally, it was like 3.45 in the morning. And I got my finger on my phone, this is the producer's moment, about with 911 right there. And I'm like, do I call 911 and bring in the fire truck? Because if I do this, the shoot's over. We're not going to make it any. <laughs> and, and I look over at the uh, our, our amazing uh, field general uh, uh, unit uh, uh, production manager, Jim Charleston, who's got like you know he's got 20 years on me, and he's just giving me this look like, don't do it, <laughs> don't do it. And so I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, like, I remember him yelling that at some point too. Don't, don't call him. Don't call him. <laughs> yeah. So we did set we set the sales set on fire a little bit. I went there the, the the next day and I could see like the black marks just on the tree. From the shoe? Oh, oh. The tree was oh, black from Jesus. the yeah. yeah. But we yeah. There was actually a movie theater nearby. In the Seattle Center, I, I, I ran into the movie theater. So yeah, I need water. I need water. The, the Seattle Center's on fire. You were just gonna take like cups of water. Yeah, water. Yeah, I was looking at a picture. I was like, the guy's like, man, we don't have any water, man. I was like, look, it's flash of fire. Yeah, no water, mom, at the theater. Yeah, I know. It's like, yeah, it was wow. crazy. It didn't make any sense. Right. So Better on the last day than the first day of production. That's what I think. Yeah, that's, yeah, oh, yeah. That's, 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 yeah. So to answer your question, 21 days, but 21. Like, it felt like 22. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Let's do, yeah, let's do two, uh, 
two more. Yeah, so I saw two. Uh, one there. Yes. Hello. hello. Oh. Is that Dan? Yeah, hi. Hi. Hi, Dan. Uh, a couple things. Uh, was, the, uh, was the actual incident at a public space rather than at a house? And, and the other thing was about the uh, orchestral score and, and its prominence and how you work with the composer. So the question was, was the actual accident, uh, incident uh, in a public space uh, and instead of in, inside? Was that in, in, instead of the house? And then also the orchestral influence of the film. Um, so, yeah, in terms of it happening in the, I mean, the way it happened is really like, in terms of like the sequence of events is really exactly, um, you know, to the best of our abilities, best of my abilities to set it down uh, as it happened. So, um, yeah, the, the shooter did go to a rave um, and he planned, he had already written a letter. He planned on carrying out a, a, a shooting, um, you know, for whatever reason. It was, he didn't go in right away shooting, and while he was there, um, he was invited to an after party, and then he took up the offer, and he went to the house, and he was there for several hours talking to the people that he planned on killing, and um, yeah, I mean, that's, it's just like, the, in terms of the sequence of events, that's, it's all exactly as it happened in real life. Um, and then the, so the question was, the orchestral scores, are you talking about specifically at the rave when there's classical music playing, or are you talking about the whole, whole score? Yeah, there was pretty prominent. Maybe talk about that. Um, yeah, that's the UC, Sirenes, um, and uh, uh, yeah, so, so I mean, sometimes it just just wanted to kind of step back out of the rave world and kind of look at it a bit more cosmically, um, rather than just having straight rave, rave music all the way through the film. Um, the, the person who did most of, or much of the rave uh, music that he hears uh, in the film is Chris Crooker, who's here right now, somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So most of the music you hear, I, I, took, um, I took a lot of his tracks and just kind of, well, sometimes I like stack several of them on top of each other, um, depending on the different sequence, to sort of, um, uh, yeah, change, change the moods when I, I could write the points I needed to. But I don't know, does that answer your question? I'm not sure if I have Okay. And yes. So the two part question I have is for Jaeger, uh, regarding how you went into writing the project because you had that adjacent experience to not being there when you could have been, uh, was that influenced in any way by sort of being like wrong place at the right time in a way? And then also the, the follow up question for that is I noticed. Uh, it seemed like that this was more filmed from the perspective of remembering the friends that you lost and kind of like presenting how they lived in that in that culture, if you will. Was, is that what that was, or was it something different? Um. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, of, of course. Yes. Yeah. So, so, I mean, this is like a very sp specific film to to make. Like, I don't think I could if I just like heard about this story. Just go and make a film like this. I felt comfortable writing this film because I I was not I was not there uh, that at that at that house that night. Um, uh, I was invited to, to to the rave, which I did not go to. Um, and yeah, I don't know if, if I had been there, I would be able to make make the film. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I I felt comfortable writing the story because I, I I knew the real people and I knew how they talked. And many of the conversations in the film are based on real conversations that I'd heard. Um, so, so yeah, and, uh, yeah. of course, uh, my, my knowing real people influenced uh, that too. I mean, that's the whole thing, whole thing, really. And the other question was, you said, the being at the right place at the wrong, wrong time. Wrong at the right time. Wrong place at the right time. Wrong place at the right time. What was being, the question? Being, being that, like I said, you could have been there because you had been invited to the rave and yeah. you know, Yeah. And did that influence how you went about writing the thing? Because you could call it a close call of sorts. You know, I, I think that that aspect, the fact that I could have been there, is probably like um, not a big influence on me. Because you know, I, I knew real people who uh, 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 who 
died and who, who uh, maybe was survived this, who were at the house and associated with this. So like, just just how it affected me. Like, I could have been there. Um, I, I don't like that. Part, that wasn't really the main thing on my mind. Right? Yeah, no, the, the, the question that was in. The Um, for me, it wasn't as much presenting the culture as much as individuals. And uh, as we sort of alluded to earlier, I was really trying to make it a film about people being alive uh, rather than, I mean, it could have been a whole different film, like here's the shooting and then, and then here's the aftermath and the mourning and the, and the grief. Um, but it, it's, it's, I really wanted to be alive and, uh, and, and funny, you know. Uh, so for me, that, that was really the main focus thing, uh, you know, to individualize right. victims who would otherwise be anonymous and make them, you know, like, people you want to like interrupted. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And what what really attracted me to um, the culture of uh, the rave because I'm uh, my sort of foray into uh, into the world of music and camaraderie and you know. Uh, drug fuel, joyful sensation came through my uh, following the Grateful Dead, and so that world for me was so um, charged and amazing. And the characters I met, and the people from broken homes who were desperate to try and uh, have joy in their lives and do it any way they could, in any creative way they could, like that really was so. Um, present in the material that I, I read, even though it was a different generational expression of that. And um, I, I love them because, you know, they're me, you know, in many ways. Like, I, I feel the, um, the need because I came from a home that had financial advantages but spiritual poverty. So I felt the need really to, um, to uh, go out there and, you know, just do it, become part of life, you know, be in that action uh, piece. And I just, I love them on the page when I read it the first time. I think that's all we have time for. To be honest, I don't know who I'm answering to. <laughs> I'm just making that up. But if, if we can't, you know, uh, can we just have everyone who worked on the film or who was in the film just stand up really quick and uh, let's uh, give them a hand. There's a bar downstairs. We saw it, and uh, we'll be there. And a hand for Roscoe, our moderator. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I think that's it. That's Thanks for so all All right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much.